I will call this meeting to order at 6.02 p.m. on the 1st of December. Happy holidays to everybody. Um, before we get started, I'm going to say, well, well, we'll, we'll just start and then I'm going to make my suggestion when we start. Um, minutes to approve November 10th. Uh, so I'll second that. If that uh, was a motion, if it's not a motion, I, I'll move we accept the minutes. Yeah, it was fine. It was, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, all those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Fred? Aye. Me, yes. Okay. Uh, vendor and payroll warrants. Uh, anybody have any? No, no comments. comments. Nope. No. Yep. Okay, we'll move on. Um, is there public comment from anyone on a topic that is not mentioned on the agenda already? Okay, hearing none, we will move on. Um, next on the agenda is public hearings. Um, apparently there was a mix up with alerting a butters with the proper Zoom account. Um, so that they are not aware sufficiently uh, to this um, discussion with the utilities. Um, I, I know that we in theory could have the discussion with the utilities um, without the abutters and then just not vote. Um, I have an issue with that simply because we would have to have the same conversation again with the abutters. Um, so it makes no sense to me um, to have a discussion, uh, have essentially the hearing without a vote, because we'll just have to go through the, the, the same topics again when the abutters are present so that they can ask questions um, that, they, that they have every right to do so. So I'm going to suggest that we um, <coughs> apologize to um, the utility uh, representatives that are here, and unless I hear an objection from my from my fellow board members, I'm going to suggest that we give back the night to our utility guests and um, make sure that we do it right the next time with 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 poll hearings on all three locations. That's that's my suggestion. That's fine with me. I, I don't have an objection. I don't know where the uh... The origin of the error was but uh, i'm sure whoever it is is very sorry about that yeah and and again it's not it's it's not it's 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 not our place to to place blame it's just our place to move forward appropriately and we want to make sure that uh we don't um leave anyone hanging with with the ability to make comments because as we all know poll hearings and, and placement of polls is, is very important to to neighbor, neighbors and abutters. So um, I, I assume um, that it's Paul Paul Davis from Pike Telecom. Uh, Bill, I don't think you're here representing utility, are you? Uh, it has to do with a project at Yankee Candle, so I was just listening in. I see, okay. Um, well, then we will make sure that, Bill, you're made aware of, of the next, uh, well, you mean for you listening in for the utility stuff or something else, Bill? For the utilities, yeah, we'll we'll just make sure that you're made aware of of one, of one that gets rescheduled. And I apologize to both Paul and 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 Bill for um, this mix up. But you know, we're all human, and it, and it happens. And, and mm -hmm. so, my question would be: Is do, is it, is it another month, or you guys meet in two weeks? Brian, you would be the best person to answer that one. Um, that's that's going to be something that that we'll talk about, we can talk about it now if the board wants. Um, sure. I mean, we well, meet the 8th, but it's too soon for the 8th because we need to have, we need to send a butter notifications out seven days in advance. So it would have to be a date after that. Um, can I suggest, I don't know what the, what people's schedules are, but I know that, that well, you know, let, let me throw it yeah. out there. Um, I probably could meet the Wednesday before Christmas. I don't know what other people's travel plans are. My concern with that is, is that people do travel during that week and, and a butters travel during that week. And, and that may get difficult. That being said, the next logical time would be after the first. And so to, to Bill's point that he made before, then you would be looking at over a month. Um, yeah. And that may not be to the calendar liking of, of, of anyone. Yeah. 
I, I'm fine with either the 15th or the 22nd, and it would basically be the poll hearing and anything else that has come up. It wouldn't be a long meeting. <coughs> Um, and I can I could do either of those. I mean, especially it's by Zoom. So um, if someone's traveling at that very hour, yeah, it's difficult to get on. But if you've arrived at your destination, Fair. more or less doesn't matter where you are, you can join that meeting by Zoom. So it, is the 15th enough time, Brian? Yeah, we need to advertise seven. We need to send notices seven days in advance. But can you do that? Does that give you enough time to do that? Yeah, you can send them tomorrow, right? Um, yeah, we might have to obtain the postcards again from Verizon and Eversource, but uh, that shouldn't be a problem. They should have them saved. So, okay, I, I just uh, want to make sure that we're not rushing it I, and and not thinking it through carefully enough, and and whether we're smarter to do it on the on the twenty second. Um, but if you think we can get it done by the fifteenth, let's get it done by the fifteenth. Either either fifteenth or twenty second is fine with me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Bill and Paul, is is the fifteenth good for you guys since we have you here? It'll be good for me. Thank you. Uh, and that work that works for me too as well. Okay. Let Brian, let's set it for the fifteenth. And again, apologies to to both Paul and Bill for for taking the time uh, tonight uh, to. Um, and I'm, am I missing anyone else? I don't think I am who is here for the poll hearing. And I apologize if if I'm missing, if I'm not aware. Um, oh, yeah. I'd like to make a suggestion. Uh, Paul Davis with Pike Telecom. The, the poll petitions are geared more towards electrical type service. And I don't see anybody from the electric company here. So I would suggest mm -hmm. that um, Eversource be present for the poll petitions as well. Paul, you're singing our song, that's for sure. We expect everyone to, to be here. And we really try to get all utilities to, to show up for these things because there's so much cross-pollination of, of of these things. So um, right. they're so the it, ones who they're the ones who told me about this meeting. So there yeah, must where have been the a, heck are they? And there must have been an issue on their end, but I'll follow up with them tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey, Bill, you, you know how to put me in a worse mood than I already am by telling me that they knew about it and they're not here. <laughs> so I appreciate that a lot. Um, okay, is, is and, and someone here, GNM uh, Becta, is that okay for you on the 15th? And you're muted. Yep. Um, yes, that's fine. What time was that on the 15th? Brian? Uh, whatever time you guys want to do. Yeah. 6.05. We can do it right first thing if you want. Yeah. 6.05 p.m. on the on the 15th. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you, you guys. Have a great evening. And again, apologies to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't see Neil here yet. So... So I told Neil around six thirty. Okay, that's, I, that's I was what I was assuming it was going to be a poll here. Yeah, and is 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 uh, Bob showing up from the snowmobile club, or were, were we just going to do this without him, Brian? He was he was on here before. No, I didn't. It, it's on the agenda, but the person we're not waiting for the person to come, are we? Um, not necessarily. We, I mean, I don't, I don't think we need to. But he was in the Zoom. I, he was in the didn't... Zoom meeting before. Yeah, I, I don't see him anymore. Know. Um, they want to they, tell us about what they want to do for with the mayo as as pre pre previous years, Brian. Right. They want to. They want to. They want to have permission to park there, like like they have the past. It's probably yeah. been every six years at least that yeah. I know. Of. They yeah. provide a certificate of insurance. Um, we've never had any issues. Yeah. So uh, who takes care of plowing that? By the way, you're just out of curiosity. They, <clears throat> they do yeah um, they're they're a great community partner uh, you know not being a snowmobiler myself I, I i love the fact that they're so incredibly helpful with everything they do um, um but i would move that we uh, uh give permission again to the snowmobile club to use the demaya lot for winter parking i would second that all those in favor joyce aye fred aye me yes we're done
done with it. <laughs> done with that part. <laughs> done, done with that part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. COVID-19. You, you have any specific recommendations, Brian, or? Yeah. Um, I had sent out uh, the last time the board had um, voted to adopt the board of health uh, recommendations to open town buildings. Um, and at that time we had talked about just amending the, having the order amended to reflect what, what the board had wanted. So I included that in the packet. Yeah. I thought that, that, that looks accurate as to what we had intended. Um, the yeah, changes I, I that agree. Showed. Um, I just, I, I actually just scrolled past them. Um, cause I was looking at the next part of the packet. Um, and if I scroll back, it basically looks like you add, um, oh, there we go. Thank you. Yep. Um, add this number four was not something else before. It's like this line is completely added attendee log, um, ventilation and air purification. Uh, and then there was a little something on the next page, if I remember right. Yeah. Um, that lets non municipal meetings happen under those rules and, uh, and just kind of emphasizes it with the, hey, you're subject to the rules. So I think that's exactly what we had intended. Fred, do you have any? Yeah, thoughts? no, I'm, I'm with Joyce. That sounds like what we had in mind. Yeah, great, okay. So Brian, this, is, this was essentially voted on last meeting, correct? We were just looking at the, to make sure the amendments reflected the, this, the discussion, correct? Yep. Okay. Do we need another motion and vote? I that was my question. I don't think we do, but I don't think so. I think it was voted on at the last one. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, um, and you know, I I would I would I would forewarn that it may be more conversations coming up depending upon how the uh, new variant mm -hmm. is is uh, transpiring over the next two weeks, and I know that we are um, seemingly in Groundhog Day perpetually, no pun intended. Um, but we're, we're, we may have to, 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 to take another look at, at what we're doing as a town when we have more information in a couple of weeks or next week, or, or it may need to be added to the 15th. Yeah. Yep. And we'll take it up at our February 2nd meeting. Yeah. What February 2nd meeting? <laughs> That's Groundhog Day. Oh, <laughs> that's good. That's good, Fred. Yeah. I missed that entirely. I thought, what happened in January? Oh, okay. Hey, does anybody happen to know? Is there a way for us to find out uh, for our community what's our percentage of vaccinated residents? I know it's difficult because some people have 01373 for their zip code, some have 01093, some have 01039, um, and some people have PO <laughs> boxes other places, and the state tends to go with your zip code, which is why. Buckland has like practically nobody vaccinated because they all live in Shelburne Falls, you know. Uh, so, so I don't really know if there's a great way to get that information, but I've kind of wondered like what, like where does our community stand in that? I'm guessing we're probably about average for the state, but um, does anybody know how you would find that out? I think Fran probably would be the best. I, I asked Fran that question because I had a couple people <laughs> saying, hey, what a joke you guys are. You guys are only at 37% vaccination rate. And I thought, well, that's just not possible. I know this town better than that. Um, right. No, but, because my vaccine card says, has South Deerfield for the address. So I, South Deerfield's probably got 160% vaccination rate. Right. Because we, we, they get to count all the people from Waitley who were vaccinated, yep. uh, divided by their population number. Right. So which is funny, Joyce, because I live closer to South Deerfield than you do, and I have a Waitley zip code. Yeah. There you go. So, so okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to derail us and put us off uh, off our agenda. I think it's a fair question to ask Fran if he has a ballpark estimate, Brian. I have. I talked to him probably about a week ago, and he he just mentioned the whole zip code problem, and yeah, he believes yeah. it to be more, but. Yeah, they, I, I do think we're, because I'm sure they're not counting me. And yeah, anyhow. Well, you know, and, and then the next, the next, um, the next metric that we can follow is the, is the, is the booster shot metric. Yeah. Yeah. And ironically, they're probably not counting Fran because he's in 01039. 
Uh, right. He gets his mail out of Haydenville. Yeah, so go figure. Yeah, if it's by zip code, it's going to be all fouled up for the town. Right. Yeah. right, so I guess the simple answer is it may be more difficult than we, you know, mm -hmm. can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, that would take us to uh, old business, Brian. CPA application for Hurley, Hurley Park. Yep. So looking for authorization to submit um, a CPA application. Um, I don't know if it's going to come from the board or the, if it's going to come from the rec commission. Jonathan, I'm not sure what, how we want to go about this, but this would be to pay for the local match for the improvements to Hurley Heat Park um, that are 60% um, are funded by, I think it's 60, 60% 60 are funded through the park grant that the town received. Um, so CPA applications are due December 7th, I believe. Um, and we'd be looking to um, submit an application that would that would cover the town share um, and maybe a little bit more that I that I had thought about in case there needs to be any design work um, in terms of any in terms of uh, any drainage work when when the Conservation Commission looks at it um, or any sort of um, internal sketch plans that might be needed for the for the restroom renovations although I'm not really sure about that more about if there's going to be any design work for the parking yeah. lot. Yeah, I don't think the rec committee has the authority to vote on matching dollars on behalf of the town. I know that the rec committee supported this grant proposal uh, into the into the park into you know, the park grant proposal back, geez, before that was submitted. So that was a few months ago now. Um, so I I personally think that it's a it's a function of this board to uh, approve this grant. Um, yeah, and, and the CP the CPC should be aware. And I'll write him a note saying that the the, um, the rec committee was a strong opponent of this grant being written. <laughs> if you could get me that date, Brian, at some point, that'd be great. But I, the rec committee doesn't have the authority to, to to make a vote on this. Right. This is just this is so this is to uh, submit the application right for the CPA to the to the CPC. I, I'd like to out. I think we're all in favor of this. Yeah, we, we've talked yeah. about it. We voted the, the, the last special town meeting to fund this. I think the only question here is do we put in a grant, a CPA grant by the seventh? And I think yes is the mm -hmm. answer to you know, definitely put that in. And if it doesn't come from CPA, it comes from free cash. Um, but I'm pretty sure the CPA would, I, I, maybe, I don't know. I'm not on that committee, but that, I can't imagine that they wouldn't take that application seriously. Right. Yeah, I agree. I, so what do we need to mo uh, to vote on here? We need a motion to um, authorize, submission. authorize the submission of a CPA application. Yep. Okay, well, I move that we authorize the submission of a CPA application for Hurley Park uh, to pay for the local match of the park grant that the town was awarded for paving. Second. All those in favor, Joyce. Aye. Fred. Aye. Me, yes. Um, MVP projects, Brian. Actually, I'm going to take this one. So, okay. um, Last we checked in, the town was gonna to pursue three different avenues for applying for the MVP action grant. One was gonna be water resiliency through finding alternative locations for wells. One was gonna be solar installation on the town offices and one was gonna be culvert replacement in the town. Um, after speaking with the water department, there's um, they don't have enough space on their plate right now to consider relocating the wells. So we've kind of eliminated that possibility. Um, which leaves us with pursuing culverts and solar. Um, because we're kind of starting from ground zero with solar, with solar um, I'm recommending that instead of trying to actually install the panels this time around, we um, conduct a feasibility assessment um, simply because there's not a lot of institutional knowledge about how to actually um, make that happen for the town. Um, on the culvert side, I think that there are two directions we could go. Um, one is planning. So 
um, a culvert assessment for the town plus a, um, a resiliency assessment for green infrastructure and um, in, or the other hand, we could do installation of culverts that we've already identified in our MVP action plan. Um, and then also do some cold water uh, restoration so that both of those culvert options include a holistic kind of um, way to address the problem. Um, to that end, I've reached out to a number of engineering firms to request a quote, um, and uh, I'm planning on reaching out to a solar development agency as well. Um, I think what I need from you all is just to um, hear your thoughts, get approval, um, make sure that we're going in the right direction. That's it. Thoughts, anyone? Um, I was going to ask you, say, solar development agency. Do you mean like a solar installer, basically? Yeah. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, and a feasibility study, I guess that's just going to, like a lot of installers will come out and do something really quick, but you're talking about something that's a little bit more in depth where you're paying them some money for something a little bit more in depth. Um, with the hope, their hope at least that they they uh, they are able to be one of the people who could bid on a project. Right, exactly. Okay. Um, there, we also could submit an expression of interest for solar installation, but we've been running into a number of roadblocks with figuring out whether or not projects should go out to bid, and if so, um, what that process looks like, and getting a quote before putting things out to bid, which has been a little bit difficult. So um, that's the justification behind that. Yeah. I'm not I think aware to, I'm, I'm, I'm glad about getting some, you know, some outside eyes to look on because everybody's got their opinion about what's a great place. I want solar canopy for cars parking at for Sandy Lane, of course. But, you know, I am a dreamer, though. We need somebody who does this for a living to, to give us some good advice. And you probably don't get good advice unless you pay for it at least a little bit. Well... I, I think that you would get a solar and solar to come out and give you their their professional opinion. Um, I, I think that the solar industry is evolved enough not to give um, rose colored you know rose colored glasses assessments when it really is not going to be a, a, a positive action. Um, so I, I, I think that we should feel comfortable going to a couple of local installers uh, and asking them what they think. Um, that being said, I also, I also believe that we should probably reach out to uh, Mass CEC, the, the Clean Energy Center for their input. I don't know whether, uh, Hannah, whether you've done that or not, but you know, that's their job to promote clean energy and to make sure it's done correctly and to be the, the, the brains for municipalities across the state in terms of what those municipalities are, are furthering for solar installation and, and planning. So I would, I would personally reach out to them um, to, to, to get their input. And if you give them a, you know, a, 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 a one page summary of what we want to do, they'll, um, they'll be happy to, to, to respond. Now it's the holidays. So you might not get a response till, till January. I don't, I don't know. Um, but I, I think both of those avenues are, are viable avenues to get more information because I, we certainly can't run blind, but I also don't think we need to spend the money. I, I maybe I'm going to be proven wrong, but I think we should at least try to find the path of least cost before we go the path of some cost. I would look, yeah, I, I like that idea. I like the idea of going to CEC. They may be able to give us some ideas of what have been done in other communities that we can propose here. Whereas going to the solar installers, essentially we have to have the idea of what we want to do and say, is this feasible? As opposed to a, a more broad base, what can we do? I think they probably would do both, Fred, but I think that the checks and balances are there if you go to both the public entity and the private entities and then and then weigh the different in different um, data inputs that we get. Can't hurt. Oh no, I it, it can't hurt. I just think that going to CEC first 
I'm mm -hmm. trying to sort of cast a wider net. Okay, here's our town. Where where do you see as potential solar spots, as opposed to going first to the providers or installers? Because then you have to say, okay, here's our spot. What's your mm -hmm. idea of the feasibility of this spot? Well, you could actually go. I mean, now that you mention it, we could just. We already have a pretty good idea of where we could put it, and okay. we could ask some installers to give us some quotes for those sites and they know all about the incentives and like what you can do with batteries and all of that so maybe maybe doing something that's i mean what time when do we have to get this in by so this is just an expression of interest it's not even the application yet that's due oh. by mid-january um and it's a relatively simple application yeah um yeah, I, I think as long as we stick with some, I, I would really like to stick with some local installers. Um, and I, I know a few who have good reputations. At least one of them is one that I've worked with myself. Um, but others that I, I've heard of from others of having good reputations. So I can give you those offline. Um, but they, uh, maybe that, I mean, it, it seems like a, it would be a delay if we just get a feasibility study because what it'll come down to is, well, what can somebody do? And can you put batteries on the site and all that sort of thing? Right. Okay. I mean, there, are okay. four, there, there are four good ones that I can think of, and I've uh, worked with or, or interacted closely with all of them. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and again, it's there. If, if you were to call up a solar installer and say, hey, what do you think of my roof? They're going to give you an honest assessment. They're going to look at Google Maps and they're going to look at your roof and they're going to say, no, you, you you really need to cut down about 25 million trees in order to put solar on your on your house. Uh, or it's the wrong direction or whatever. whatever. Whatever it is. And and we all know that, that for Sandy Lane gets a little bit of sun. So, but it, the, the issue then is what's on the roof that would prevent solar from going on those roofs. Or there are a lot of you know, air pipes, or there are a lot of exhaust pipes, whatever it is, they're going to be able to tell you that really fast because they also don't want to waste their time. So I, I would, I would call for it personally, and I'll okay. give you the an if you want. Okay. Yeah, that would be great if you would be willing to send me some contact information for folks. Okay. And, and just to, just to, um, I guess just to reiterate. So, so Hannah, the expressions of interest are due mid January. Yes. And then the application, the actual applications are March, March. So we would need, so we would essentially need cost estimates by March to include in the applications if that's what we're going to pursue for MVP. Right. Okay. That seems, seems doable. Okay. Hannah, if you could please email me and remind me that I promised you those names because otherwise it, it's doubtful. No okay. problem. Thank okay. you. And just to circle back, um, so so Hannah's working on the express, expressions of interest. So, are you also okay if if, if um, she submits some for the culverts for thinking about sort of a townwide culvert assessment? We have a lot of institutional knowledge in one person about culverts. Um, I don't know when that person is planning on retiring, but when they do, that institutional knowledge is will probably stay in town, but yeah, won't be as convenient to access. Um, and also there were some culverts that, that were identified as high priority to replace. Um, so those, I think those, I think Hannah was thinking three or four separate expressions of interest to get feedback from MVP and then see what we get back and then put in the applications in March. Okay. Sounds good. All right, new business, Brian. Tax rate working group. Oh no, Neil's here, I'm sorry. Neil's here, yeah, <laughs> right, right on time. Yeah, no, Neil, we jumped ahead a little bit. Um, okay, good, so you're moving we're gonna, fast. We're gonna jump back now. Yeah. So what do you have for us? <laughs> you want well, me to start? <laughs> um, Brian, Brian, why don't you start? Um, so the Whitley Historical Society um, has a lease for the for the, the the historical museum at the town hall. Um, it's been a it's been a twelve a twelve month lease, and that expired September thirtieth. Um, and we realized it just recently that um, we needed to have a, a renewed lease. Um, I think it's been since 2000, I'm gonna get into the details real quick. Uh, I think it's been since 2019 
the town's been accepting uh, um, credits on it on the um, electric bill to the town hall. That um, can I can I mention the people who are donating them or is that anonymous? Sure. No, anonymous okay. donors? No. Okay. Um, no, you can mention them. Several right. others. Neil and Donna have been donating their their extra credits um, to the uh, for electricity at the town hall, and that's we've been we've been keeping track of that to offset against the rent that they owe that that the historical society owes. Um, and and looking back at that, when when I was going back through the lease, it it appears that none of those uh, Wayland Historical Society has always been making full payments on the lease. So they have about seventeen hundred dollars in, in credits um, that we would apply towards this lease. Um, so that's what th there's a, a change in the language here. I can I can bring it up. Um, and then there's also an addition. Uh, there's also some language about. Um, recognizing that the shed has been put on the property. <clears throat> I think I went past it. Oh yeah, that's right. Cause we, yeah. It's at the beginning. Yeah. I, <laughs> I know that's nice and easy to see. Uh, but it's it's pretty much the, the same terms of the lease. Um, it's in the past, it's been 1600 per year, payable in uh, four quarterly installments. Um, but it's, it's, it's pretty much the same. It, so, um, so essentially, Whitley Historical Society is looking to renew the lease on, on those terms for, uh, I guess, another 12 months. Anybody have anything? Or Neil, do you want to make a comment? So let me just comment that um, uh, in, in addition to this, as I mentioned at an earlier select board meeting, uh, the fact that the Whiteley Historical Society, which has had for decades storage space in the um, library, which uh, we are no longer eligible to have by a ruling of the building inspector, uh, we've had to rent space for storage of the collection. Uh, we have reached an agreement with five colleges uh, to rent space, as does the Hatfield Historical Society, in their climate-controlled uh, library storage facility uh, just across the town line in uh, Hatfield. Uh, it's called the Five College Library Annex. That will cost us $2,400 a year um, for that uh, as uh, at least a temporary replacement for what had been free space for storing uh, the Historical Society collection, both in uh, the center school after it was no longer being used as a school and for decades, even before that, uh, in the library. So it's becoming expensive to be the town's uh, uh, museum and uh, keeper of town treasures. Uh, but, and we hope that um, the select board will approve uh, renewing the lease for the current museum space, which has very limited storage space associated with it. Thoughts? I'm I'm fine with renewing the lease. I have no objection to renewing the lease with the uh, the amendments that uh, yeah. Brian was showing up there. They make sense. Let me I'm just really say sorry that. about your about the storage space thing. I'm not sure what exactly can be done about that. But. Well, as the plans settle for the uh, build out of the current town offices, uh, we hope that maybe some thought can be given to uh, where there might be a corner that, but maybe not for uh, storage of some of these items. Um, I'll also note that there is in the center school, a large drafting table used for spreading out apps for work of the cemetery commission. Uh, that was not moved to the town offices when the offices moved out of the center school. And we're hoping that we can find a place um, 
in the space that is shared by the Board of Health and the Water Department and the Assessors and the Cemetery Commission for having that table where maps can be spread <coughs> rather than having to have them drop over the edge of, of tables. So it's a separate issue than the Historical Society, but getting everything that the town owns out of the center school and uh, getting the Historical Society things out of the library is, is an ongoing work in progress. We hope to, to be moved out to facilitate the renovation of the library with the construction of the uh, accessibility aspects, uh, the new restrooms and the, uh, the lift. Um, we hope to be out by the middle of December. Uh, just taken a while to negotiate that. So that that's all part of the general halo of work we're doing to protect and preserve uh, the town's history and work, uh, which is uh, getting now increasingly expensive to document and to preserve. Okay. I, I should add that on the proposed lease uh, amendments, there is one that uh, sort of memorializes in the lease the agreement that the town reached with the Historical Society uh, about reductions in the lease if there should be a recurrence of things like uh, the COVID lockdown that closed the building, limiting access. And so that there's uh, just adding to the lease that uh, mid-year agreement for a, a sort of refund on lease payments that had been made when uh, the museum space was not accessible uh, before the town hall was reopened for actual public use in its meeting rooms, uh, we were given uh, permission as uh, the, the organization leasing space to begin uh, resuming our sort of internal use of the museum, even though the uh, public access uh, to the museum was uh, restricted until the, the building was opened under conditions for public access. Okay, um, unless anybody has any other comments, I would uh, entertain a motion. Uh, I'll, I, go ahead, Fred. Okay, i move that we renew the lease for the Whaley Historical Society for another year as laid out in the documents provided for the meeting. Yeah, I'll second that as amended. All, all those in favor, Fred? Aye. Joyce? Aye. Me, yes. Unanimous. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Neil. Oh, thanks, Thank you, Neil. Neil. Thanks for all the things you do too, Neil. Yes. Well, it's the advantage of being retired. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, tax rate working group, Brian. All right, buckle your, buckle your seatbelts. All right. It's pretty interesting stuff. <sighs> So um, every year that, actually, I'll just get into it. Um, every year that the select board has to make tax policy decisions um, in relation to um, setting the tax rate. Um, and some point last year was suggested that it was suggested by Fred Barron that, that there be established um, somebody from the finance committee, from the board of assessors and um, Fred was the, the, the select board rep to, to talk about um, really, really talk more in depth about setting the tax rate instead of sort of the um, sort of one night discussion that we that we typically have. Um, so I'm going to have a quick PowerPoint presentation that, that I want to go over, um, sort of lays out just a reminder as to what the tax policy decisions are that are to be made. Um, we wanted to come on the first tonight. Um, and sort of lay out some of the information. The actual tax classification public hearing is advertised for December 8th. Um, so there's time between now and obviously the 8th if there's questions or information that, that the board wants. Um, it gives us the opportunity to get that in time for the public hearing. Um, so I'll get right into it. All right, can everybody see that? Yep. All right, so quick 
I'll run through these kind of kind of quickly because um, background. Every fiscal year before the tax rate is set, the select board must hold a public hearing to consider tax rate options available to the municipality. Um, the hearings are held. The hearing is held after the assessors have determined final values, um, and those have been certified by the Department of Revenue. And then the select board conducts a classification hearing that I was talking about, and that's scheduled. That's going to be that's advertised for December eighth, and then votes on uh, the different available tax rate options. These are these are. Uh, there's only a handful of options that municipalities are given the opportunity to vote on, and the rest is controlled by the state. Um, they 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 hold the, the taxation power um, quite closely. Um, so, what are the decisions the select board is being asked to, or will be asked to decide on the eighth? So, it's whether there should be a single or split tax rate, and that is should there be a different tax rate for the residential and open space properties as opposed to the commercial, industrial, and personal property. Um, there's uh, the question of whether the, whether the town wants to award an, or grant an open space discount, whether it wants to grant a resident, residential exemption, or whether it wants to grant a small commercial exemption. So there's really four questions that the board has to answer. Um, so I'll just run through those quickly. Uh, single or split tax rate. Um, Again, I just mentioned the classifications of property, um, residential, open space, commercial, industrial, and personal. Um, so essentially the, the, temp, the select board adopts a residential factor um, and that governs the percentage of the tax levy paid by the, so there's two categories, right? Residential and open space and commercial, industrial, and personal properties. And the board votes on a residential factor, and that determines the percentage that each of those two categories pays. Um, the adoption of residential factor of one results in taxation of all properties at the same tax rate. That's historically what the town has done. It's been a single tax rate across all classes of property in town. Um, so the board can adopt a residential factor less than one or more than one. If it's less than one, it reduces the share of the levy paid by the residential open space classes and increases the share paid by the um, CIP classes. Um, the opposite's also true. Um, if it's a residential factor greater than one, you can shift the tax burden onto the residential and open space and decrease it on the CIP classes. I don't know of any municipality that does that. It's always um, shifting the burden away from residential. Actually, Brian, there are a couple on the Cape that do that. Oh, really? Yes. I was not aware of that. Must be nice to have a lot of expensive <laughs> homes like that. Um, so that's a decision, single or split tax rate. And we'll talk about what that looks like for fiscal year 22 in a minute. Uh, the open space discount is what I talked about. Um, Select board may allow for a discount of all class two open space properties. I'll, I'll, I'll spoiler alert, the Waitley Board of Assessors does not classify open space as uh, class two properties. It's classified in different ways, um, like chapter 61A, um, chapter 61B, so the chapter properties, and also um, I think by vacant or accessory land, but maybe Fred can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I know there's there's no no properties classified as class two. Um, so it's not really an option at this point in time. Uh, residential exemption is a possibility. Uh, the select board may grant a residential exemption to all class one residential properties that are the principal residence of the taxpayer. Um, so really the attempt here is to shift the tax burden within the residential class um, from essentially to vacation homes, rental units, and higher valued residential properties. Um, that's a shift within the RO classification. Um, so it's not, um, it's not affecting the, the commercial industrial property um, taxes or tax rate. Small commercial exemption, this is the last one. Uh, so we're may grant a small commercial exemption to all class three commercial properties. Um, and the requirements are, that the property is occupied by a business with an average annual employment of no more than 10 people and on a property with an assessed valuation of less than 1 million. 
Um, so what this does is it, 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 it shifts the tax burden within um, the commercial and industrial classifications onto um, larger, uh, larger properties or larger uh, companies, however we wanna think about it, larger taxpayers. Um, so the burden would be shifted away from uh, those businesses with less than 10 employees and less than a million dollars in evaluation. It's just a quick question for the purpose of this, are the farm businesses considered commercial properties? Um, I don't believe that the farms are listed as uh, class three. Okay. All right. Uh, but Fred can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, All right, please specify your Fred. <laughs> farms are not listed as commercial. Okay. Although they could be listed as mixed use, but that's a different, no. different category. No, they, oh, okay. So they would not be like, it wouldn't be like, because they're going to have lots of land. The land might be more than worth more than a million dollars but you know so you're not shifting to them under this because they're not considered commercial at all no right okay understood yep and and brian the exemption is a full exemption it's not a partial exemption if it's an exemption it's a full exemption correct um there's a there's a certain amount that that is exempted so it's not a full exemption of paying taxes no yeah it's a certain percent of the assessed value. I'd have to look up exactly what it is. That um, would probably be important. Look, be looking at the number of properties that would qualify for this, I looked earlier today, there's maybe two or three at the most in town that would qualify for this type of exemption if, if allowed. For the residential part or the commercial? Or commercial. Yeah, I'm going to get into that in a, in a couple minutes later. Okay. Uh, small scale commercial exam, uh, exemption is the exemption may not exceed 10% of the assessed value of each eligible class three property. So they're essentially taking off 10% of whatever the assessed value would have been of that property. And then they're multiplying that by the tax rate to get some tax payment. And, and Brian, if I remember correctly, if uh, if a, there are exemptions that their share gets redistributed within that class, so within the CIP class, not across all lines. Right. Right. Yeah. It stays within the it stays within the the CIP class. Yep. Yeah. The exemptions stay within stay within those two categories. Right. The resident they shift within those two categories. The exemptions and the discount. When we split, if we split the tax rate, then that's shifting between the two categories of property. Okay. Yeah. Um. So the so um this group had we met several times, three times I think, three or four times. They all blend together. They were so much fun. <laughs> um. So we wanted to talk about about a little bit more about single or split tax rate as it would apply to. Uh, the upcoming fiscal year. So the DLS uh, Depart Division of Local Services is a, part of, is a part of the Department of Revenue, and they finally developed this what's called an options table in in the DLS Gateway system, which allows us to um, essentially type in a couple couple estimates of the tax levy, and it gives us this great spreadsheet that shows um, tax rates uh, based on our information. If we were to shift, um, if we were to split the tax rate, so um, the amount of shift that's shown here, um, so the maximum is fifty that's allowed. So, so for fiscal year twenty two, our estimate is if there was no shift in the tax rate, um, I mean if there was no shift, the tax rate would be thirteen fifty nine. Um, that's a, um, I think it's currently fourteen ninety two, and what's at play here in lowering it so much is that. Um, the town just finished a five-year revaluation, um, and there was um, a, there was significant growth in terms of total assessed value. I think it was averaged about twelve and a half percent. So it's it's you're kind of playing games with total assessed value and tax rate. Um, 
one goes up, the other goes down, but it doesn't necessarily mean that anybody's paying less, you know, a smaller tax bill. Um, so, but fiscal year 22, um, so hypothetically, so these are the different shifts, right? If it was 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, 50 this would be RO is residential and open space, CIP is commercial, industrial, personal. Um, no shift, thir uh, 1359. And then as you see, as you shift more to the CIP, the tax rate goes higher and it's lower for the residential and open space. Um, and I just, so I included in the next slide, this is if we picked a 20% shift. Um, and this is just residential property. And what I'm, what I'm comparing here, what, or what the group is comparing here is here's assessed value of property. Um, this is, if there's no shift, this is what the tax would be owed on those properties. If the board were, were to adopt a 20% shift, this is what the tax would be owed. Um, because again, it's tax rate multiplied by assessed value um, divided by a thousand, essentially. Um, and this would be the difference. Um, so let's well, let's say this is so three six three hundred sixty four thousand is the average single family value. Um, so the average single family value on a twenty percent shift would pay um, two hundred fifty five two hundred fifty five dollars less in taxes than it would if the board adopted no shift. Um, so we also did this for CIP properties. Um, and it's, again, it's, it's essentially the same table. This is the assessed value. This is the CIP with no shift. This is the CIP properties, um, with a 20% shift. And this is how much more the CIP properties would pay, um, at, at this assessed value. Um, and again, this is looking at a 20%. Um, the board could could decide to do no shift up to a 50% shift. 50% um, is capped by by the Division of Local Services. Um, so, so when we do this, there's a savings to residential and there's an increased burden to commercial, industrial, and personal. Um, do we know where the average sits on that? You put for the average residents, but commercial properties, do they just vary so much that you, there's not a meaningful... Uh, it, average yeah it's a really small sample size with some really extreme values oh, um because okay. we have very two very large manufacturers that have significant uh, okay land values okay um, all right so it average is not so it, it, but it's, it seems to bear out the sort of the the four to one for every um for every dollar you save a resident, uh, some the business side has to pay four dollars more, right? Roughly. Yeah. I I can explain a little more what on this table. The if you go back to the uh, residential one, that I guess the highlighted one is is kind of the the average. Uh, Ninety percent of the people in town are going to be less than probably five hundred thousand. In value, you got ten percent that are five hundred or higher in town. Ten percent of the properties are valued that way. If you if you look at the uh, commercial one, the next the next one, Brian, it's uh, probably the uh, the average is between the four and five hundred thousand range. There there's a handful that are over or close to a million or over, but it's less than 10 probably of all commercial and industrial. So the majority is in the four to 500 range. Fred, is it fair to say that there are a couple that are well over a million? Yes, yes, there are two large ones. I don't know if Brian is gonna get into that in his table or not, uh, but yes. And, and, it, and how much over John, it, If I remember five, correctly, those two are at roughly five and seven million. So okay. you, that's easy multiplication. Right. Um, I guess my other question, if you go back to residential, you, you see the average, but what about the mean? 
the mean is is going to be close to the average because there's so many so many more uh, people involved in in the average. I mean, here you've you've got uh, eight some eight hundred. I think it's eight hundred sixty properties involved here in the, in the average. Uh, so the mean is going to be close to that. And if you look at the the other commercial industrial properties, there's I think like a hundred. So the mean if you, is little less than the average, not much. But here we're talking on residential. The mean and average are very close. Okay. And I believe that the largest residential assessment in the town is just over 2 million. So even taking that one out, that would move the average by a couple of thousand. So it would have a much smaller impact than the, than on the industrial commercial side. Be because of the large sample size of residentials. Right, right. Um, so that's, so we also have, um, we also sent the board some additional spreadsheets and things like that, um, that were provided in email um, that will hopefully, you know, inform some, some of your decisions. Um, and we'll also enter those into the record for the public hearing so that, so that those are on the record. Um, so this is, this is just an example of, of a 20% shift. Again, it could be anything from zero to 250 really. Um, and those, um, some of those spreadsheets, you can you can plug in uh, different percentages, and it'll it'll run the numbers. Um, but in addition to um, sort of the numbers part of this, uh, the the group also discussed what are some of the what are some of the really the the factors or, or arguments for one or the other. Um, and just wanted to highlight some here. Again, there was a there was a. Uh, another document that had some of these in a little bit greater depth, um, but additional considerations to support a single tax rate um, that the group had talked about was Whitley has always had a single rate, um, fairness, so everyone pays the same rate per valuation, um, a split rate charging CIP properties more as anti-business and may encourage businesses to leave town or not open in Whitley. Um, there would be additional administrative work for the assessors and tax collectors to prepare the tax bills. Um, only four towns in Western Massachusetts have a split tax rate and the benefits to residential taxpayers is not sufficient to justify the burden on CIP taxpayers. Do, do we know which four towns those are? Yes, Brian, it's, it's, there's four towns in Franklin County. Oh, Franklin County. If, uh, if you want, if you want to look at Western Mass, you know, I did that one time, there's probably 10. 10 towns okay. in all of Western Mass, which uh, is mostly the cities. You can, you can picture the bigger cities in Western Mass are the ones that have the split rate. Right, I mean, I'm sure Pittsfield did when GE was the, the big game in town. Right, but you got to Springfield, you got West Springfield, uh, Chickabee, Agawam, all in uh, Westfield, bigger cities that are. So what are the towns okay. in Brampton County? Irving, Rowe, Monroe, and there's one other. No, oh, it's a, it's a... Monroe. I wasn't expecting Monroe. It's Florida. 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 Yes, you're right. I mean, Rowe. Florida, Florida, Florida is not in Franklin County, County, is it? Yes, I, Florida, Irving, Rowe, and Montague are the four towns. And Montague. I, I would have guessed Rowe and Irving for obvious reasons because of the, the yeah. large... You. you know, and, and, and row doesn't fit into that category as much anymore because it's, it's the funk, yeah. but not row, but you know. Well, um, Mont Montague has Fall River. Not Fall yeah. River, uh, Turner's Falls. Yeah, no, of course, but it's just the, in, in, in yeah. Irving and in row, you had one in each, in each community, just ginormous right. assessed yeah. value. For, for right. product, you know. In Monroe, you do too. There's a hydro plant there. Oh, is there? Oh. Okay. Okay. I didn't, have, I didn't have Monroe. It's not Monroe. It's yeah. Florida. I thought it was Monroe. Yeah. And Florida has, yeah, Florida has some wind farms and as well. Florida has hydro also. 
They're both yeah. on the river. Okay. Got it. Florida's not Florida's in Berkshire County then. No. It's near the mass near the New York line. Florida's in Berkshire County. I thought Florida's, yeah, yeah that's what I thought. As well. Florida's in Berkshire County, yeah. Yeah, Florida's in Berkshire County. Okay. Okay, so we're only got three. No, I think it's four. I just don't remember what the fourth. I know row. Greenfield's not a split, right? No. no. Monroe is one. I'm just going through. I've got a list yeah. here. I heard Hadley was the split rate. Hadley well. just adopted it. But Hadley's in Hampshire County. Right. They're not Frank. Right. But they're a town in West Massachusetts that has now adopted. Right. And, and you know, and, and they have such a large commercial base that, you know. Absolutely. Right. So. Okay. Yeah. Hadley, you've got to look at the reasoning, reasoning why the newspaper didn't do justice to that. This is wonderful assessment. This is wonderful analysis. So additional considerations to support a split tax rate. So the property tax is regressive. Large multinational corporations pay the same rate as property owners with lower fixed income. Could argue that lowering the residential tax rate makes Waitley more competitive on the residential real estate market. Um, Due to the five-year revaluation, most residential properties increased in assessed value at a greater percent than larger CIP properties. These larger CIP properties will actually pay less in taxes in fiscal year 2022 compared to uh, 21 due solely to the large increase in total residential values. And then um, the decision is reviewable every year. Okay. And, and there are there are downsides to reviewing every year because it's very difficult for anyone to plan effectively. Yeah, the unknown is not something that's terribly friendly. Yeah. I don't. Yep. Um, so I'm just going to leave single or split tax rate and just address the other ones. And, and if we want to go back to that discussion, we can. Um, like I mentioned, for the open space discount, we don't. Uh, the board of assessors doesn't use class uh, two for open space designation, so that's not an option at this time. Um, if that's something we want to consider, we should talk to the Board of Assessors for, for, for future years. Um, residential exemption. So looking at the, the LA-4, which is what lists different classifications of property, the number of parcels that would qualify, I should say that would not qualify for this exemption. So the ones that we would shift the burden to um, are really small, right? Um, the Board of Assessors lists two apartments in Waitley. And while we think there are likely additional rental units in town, we don't have any significant, uh, you know, vacation home communities or condos or apartment buildings um, that we would shift the burden to. So it's it's difficult with that small number to make a meaningful impact um, on the overall residential rate for owner occupied properties. Say, so Brian, can can I just jump in here real quick? Yep. The thought of moving monies and where monies go obviously is an important one, but you also have to take into consideration that these moves are gonna create a climate and it's gonna create a climate in town, not only for those living in town, but for those coming in. And um, how, do, how does the board wanna see this town progress um, downstream? Um, and I think that is, especially in this case, um, what do we look like downstream? And um, I just want to keep it at that. Okay. Yep. Okay. I just want to throw my two cents in. So that's the residential exemption, um, small commercial exemption. So as a reminder, um, to be eligible, properties must have must be occupied by a business that has 10 or less employees and a valuation of less than $1 million. So this is a, the small commercial exemption is an application that's filed with the Board of Assessors each fiscal year. Um, and the Board of Assessors can request a list from the state. Um, and so it's, it's a, the state provides a list of the, a certified list of employers in town who have 10 or less employees. Um, and the Board of Assessors uh, pulled that list. We're told that the contents of it are uh, essentially who's on it is is confidential. Um, so I didn't want to talk about certain businesses in um, in an open meeting, but I can say that there was 26 businesses 
um, that are certified by the Commonwealth as having less than 10 employees in Waitley. Um, so there's, there's 26 individual businesses listed. I did wanna mention there's 142 CIP properties um, based on the assessor's data. Um, so, so I tried, I cross I tried to cross-reference the, the addresses on the, um, the addresses on the list from the state with, with the assessor's list of commercial, industrial, and personal property. Um, and what I found was, um, I think there was all but, um, that what most of the companies listed on the list wouldn't, um, wouldn't qualify for the exemption. I mean, I'm sorry, would qualify for the exemption. Um, either that they qualify or that they, a lot of the businesses are, seem to be on properties that are classified as residential. So I think a lot of them are home-based businesses. Um, so it's not this, so the small commercial exemption is not gonna be this, um, if we're looking to save small businesses from a, from a shift in the tax rate, it's not going to be this great tool that we can use to reach a lot of to reach a lot of people, um, to reach a lot of small yeah. businesses. Quick question: Did anybody check that this list contains all the businesses in Waitley and those that have the 01373 zip code didn't get counted as not being in Waitley? Um, that's a good question. I I don't know how the list was. I'd have to look more in more detail at the list. There's a lot That's of provided. five and ten. A lot of five and ten, I think, is oh one three seven three for their zip code. But it isn't yeah. at all based upon assessment, and, and the assessors don't go by by zip code. They they go on. I don't know. This the list came from the it's state. From the state. So, yeah. Oh, so I see your point. I got your point, Joyce. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So we need to cross reference between what the state does and what the assessors do. Yeah. Joyce, you are correct. All of these zip codes on this list are 01093 zip codes. That's problematic. Yeah. Well, there could be, so there could be other businesses that the state isn't telling us about that would qualify for this um, CIP. It just might be hard to find them or we might need to ask, we might need to ask them to run that list for South Deerfield. <laughs> um, I don't know that there's that many businesses in West Waitley to for the 01039. Um, and then there's others that one. if they have their office as a PO box in Hatfield, you know, that's that's the other place where more many people from our town have have zip codes. Says the the person who just mailed out the most recent scoop. We, we've got it, it, it would involve an education, you know, a publicity campaign to let people who are in the town know that if this got approved, yeah. that it was an option. But it's also hard to assess what the effect is going to be if we don't have good data on how many businesses would qualify for this. But Brian, Brian, looking at that, looking at that list, it gives two two addresses for each business here that is uh, of the twenty six. The, the legal address, which includes all of the. It has uh, 01093 plus 0137 in there, and it gives a physical address. 1039, yeah. Physical address is all 1093. So all of these oh. are located in, in Waitley. Now, I don't <laughs> know, you know, if you're looking at for a Haydenville, Haydenville zip code number or Williamsburg zip code number, uh, it, it's not in this <laughs> list at all. Well, I, I don't think there are many businesses because it's that's just there's only um, about 95 addresses there, and I I think that might be 95 residential addresses. Yeah, I don't think 20, yeah, yeah. I think it's gonna be State Road that's the 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 largest number of. Yeah, I think State Road is the one to worry about. State uh, State Road would be largest, but there could still be businesses in houses in residential units. Right, but businesses that are in residential units. Are not in the CIP portion of the tax. No. They're in the RO, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, okay. it did, well, Brian, would they be? Because you are we talking about zoning, residential, commercial, or are we talking 
usage residential. We're talking, we're talking uh, assessors' use codes. Okay, so it's not the zoning because West Waitley would all be zoned residential, but it may not have a residential use code. It, it's done by use codes, correct? Done by use. Yeah, it gets very confusing. It's okay. really confusing. But it may, so, might be might be something to check in the next week. Yeah, we I can ask the we can ask the board of assessors to reach back out <laughs> to uh, uh, the Department of Unemployment <laughs> Assistance that certifies the the businesses and see what else they have. Okay. okay. This is this is great. Is there anything else, Brian, or is that pretty much it? Um. Well. Um, next step. So, but as I mentioned, the tax classification hearing is December eighth at 6 p.m. Um, and then we'd be looking for the board to vote at that time as well. Um, so it's it's really those four questions. Um, and there's a lot more data in those. There's a lot more data in the spreadsheets that have been that have been sent out. Um, but it's again, it's single or split tax rate, open space discount, residential exemption, small commercial exemption. Um, so that's what we'll be coming back on the 8th to talk about and and we don't currently provide open space dis space discount residential exemption or a small commercial exemption correct yeah, there, there would be no reason to at this point with a single tax rate right right mm -hmm. okay then we should probably move on and we all have our homework to do for yeah. uh for the next week so Brian, the additional spreadsheets and whatever that you provided the board, is that going to be online somewhere for people to look at? Um we we we, we can. Good um idea. what do we do? I all can right. post I can post all the material that was sent to the board if that's if that's what we want to do. Well well for one, I would like to see it because I don't know what you presented to the board other than what you showed on the screen today. And how are other people in town gonna to know what was presented to the board if you don't show it somewhere, make it available? Well, everything's public document, Fred, obviously. Right, yeah. but how do you access it? How does it, how did other people, businesses say that are concerned, maybe concerned to this, how are they gonna access what was presented to the board? I, I have no problem posting this stuff on, on online. Yeah. Anybody else? If no, I, it should be posted. Yeah. I, I took it to me when, when Brian posts the, the meeting stuff that this was going to go with it. Um, I don't know if it goes posted with the agenda to the next meeting or if it gets posted with the minutes and uh, video for this meeting, but yeah, I don't have any problem with posting it either. Well, if it's, One, not, if it's not in a video, nobody's going to see it other yeah. than the board. No, 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 I mean, post it with the video, meaning in addition to the video, post these documents. That's all I'm saying. Just um, one of the spreadsheets on there does have the addresses of specific locations in town and all of their tax data. So have to make a decision as to whether or not that is something that should go townwide. Uh, is that public information? I yeah. think that's a public record anyway. Yeah, it is a public record. And at one time we published all of that at the end of every year in the um, in the town annual uh, report, annual report. Everybody's taxes were in there. So um, one of the things along with that is, yes, the addresses are on there. But if I were the board, I would want to put names on those addresses, uh, not for the public, but I would want to know that personally. If I was going to raise someone's taxes, I want to know who that person is, what business that is, and to what extent um, that impact would mean. Um, I would want to know that. But, you know, Paul, the, the flip side of that is that adds a personal element to the decision making that is more that it adds subjectivity to the decision as opposed to objectivity. It, it absolutely it absolutely does. You're right about that. But then at the end of the day, you may have to face someone who 
approaches you and says, you raised my taxes and you didn't even know it was me? I mean, and the answer to that, that is that, yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right. Easier, easier well, call. If you're in Springfield or if you're in Holyoke, that's one thing. But if you're in Little Waitley and everybody knows everybody, um, well, I just want to uh, say that it. I, I it think may, all, all the more reason easier. not to put the names on. Hmm. I'm not people, saying Paul, Paul Fred, I, I would Fred, say if Fred, people listen, want the names, Fred, they, listen, they can Fred, look them up. You didn't listen to me, Fred. I'm what sorry. I said, well, just take a second. Yep. What I said was if I was a select board member, I would want to know who these, what those names were. And the, the larger entities in town, who, who that was and where that shift was going. That's what I said. I don't mean, I don't mean to put a list out with everyone's names on it like we did in the past. I didn't say that. What I said was if I was making the decision as a select board person, I would want to know where the shift of dollars was going to and not just a, a number. Put it that way. Yeah. And honestly, I think as a, as a select board member, I don't want to know who it is. You have I mean, that I right. I can find out if I want, but. I mean, you have that right, sure. I, okay. I don't want to make it personal. I want to make it policy. Yeah. Okay. Let, let me, let me I appreciate say, what you're saying, Paul. Let okay. me just say one thing. Are these numbers, and I don't know exactly which one Brian is going to gonna make available. These are not the final numbers. These are, this is pretty close to the final, an estimate. This does not it's an estimate. include personal property on there or other things that these people are, may have to pay additional tax on. So if somebody looks at this and say, oh, you told me here online I'm paying this tax amount, that is not true. May not, okay, that may not be true. So somehow on here, we need to identify this is an estimate or preliminary or something. Because for one thing, there is no personal property assigned to any of these properties that we've identified, the three categories. No personal property, some of them pay personal property, which is gonna increase the values the increase in taxes that are going to be more than what's shown on this sheet. Right. So if you're going to use examples of individual properties, you, we need to put some kind of caveat on here that's an estimate or preliminary figure so people don't assume this is it because it is not true. Right. It's an inexact science at this point. Okay. Right. Point taken. Okay. Um, we're going to move on. Um, this has been a great discussion, and the and the assess the, and the analysis is is incredibly helpful. Um, and we'll have a lively conversation next Wednesday of that, I am certain. So we are going to go now to um, uh, vote to enter an agreement with Terrence Reynolds. Brian, you want to you want to go? Yep. So um, we essentially we need an engineer to do some of the engineering work on the complete streets uh, projects that we have funded through the Complete Streets Grant. So that's the uh, sidewalk extension to um, across from the church, um, from the Betts Memorial uh, down to across from the church um, for the, um, the sidewalk extension at the elementary school and some additional uh, road safety improvements um, to get some ideas at the intersections of Williamsburg Road and Conway Road. Um, so Keith and I, um, our previous engineer who we had used, Sarah Campbell, um, She's not available. She's a uh, she's out on, I believe, FEMA deployment in some tropical location. Um, so she's not able to come back and help us. Um, and she recommended uh, Terry Reynolds and Keith and I met with him. Um, but we drove to these different locations and he provided us a cost estimate uh, to do that um, really minor engineering work. Okay. Um, I, anybody have any comments before I entertain a motion? Hearing none, do I hear a motion? Uh, but, but oh. One thing, I have to say that I know Terry Reynolds in that I bought my house from him. And I don't, I don't know if that would be a grounds for recusal or not. Do you know anything about his background other than he? As an engineer, no, I know what my dealings with him 
such as they were in buying the house. I, I guess, Fred, from my opinion, you have to make that assessment yourself. Yeah, you've certainly disclosed that you know him, but I, I don't think just knowing somebody constitutes a conflict. Well, I had a business transaction with him, so yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Well, then well, you know, we will understand if you choose to recuse yourself. Um, I, I am guessing it's not going to impact the vote, though that's just a guess. So what we'll do, Fred, is um, I will make, I will look for a motion. I'll make a motion to uh, to appoint Terry Reynolds um, for the complete streets. Do I hear a second, Joyce? I second entering an agreement with Terry Reynolds. Okay, and so what I'll do, Fred, is I will ask for a voice vote, Joyce. Uh, yes, I am in favor. I will say me, and then I will say, Fred, would you like to vote or recuse yourself? I will recuse. Okay. All but right. But John, you didn't say how you were voting. I did say yes. I'm sorry if, I, if okay. it wasn't clear. I apologize. All right, uh, Tegan Bond for Christian Lane culvert replacement. Yep. They come recommended by our highway superintendent, I assume? I hope so. <laughs> okay. Um, um. <laughs> I'm just trying to bring up the, bring up the, the sheet here real quick. <clears throat> Are they the only proposal received, Brian? Yeah, they're the only ones that that we had talked to. Okay. Um, so this is a proposal from Time Bond. This is this is for work um, on the Christian Lane culvert. Uh, this is a culvert between Castaways and uh, the fire station. Essentially, um, there's a residence in between there, um, and this was the. This was their proposal for, for field data collection. It was 37, uh, 37,600. Engineering and design was $59,700. Um, the grant that we have that, that we received from the Division uh, Department of Ecological Restoration was 57,000 um, and some change. Um, so um, this is their proposal. Um, Hannah and I had a discussion with with um, the, the grant representative from, from DER. Um, and we inquired about whether there would be any additional funds that, that may become available um, through the grant program. And they'll have a better idea of that um, probably within the next you know, three or four weeks, prob so probably in sometime in January if we're, if we're being realistic. Um, and we have, what we have with the grant is a, is a tight timeline. Um, it's budget year money, so it needs to be spent by June 30th. Um, and I think our preference would be to, um, if if the board agrees, to get time bond started at least on the field data collection, um, so they can get that work going. Um, and then, um, if if there's no additional monies coming from the grant program, we would have to figure out either where the difference comes from or return. You know, a portion of the grant uh, that's not that's above and beyond the the thirty seven six hundred, um, which I think um, there's possibilities where, where we could find additional money. One could be the uh, the CL CLF RF money, the COVID monies that the town has. Um, you know, in, um, stormwater infrastructure such as culverts is an eligible uh, eligible activity. Um, I'm not sure. Um, where we are with our balances in terms of chapter 90. Um, and also, you know, free cash would be an option, but um, I don't, it, it seems premature to make those decisions to spend our money if we're waiting for an answer from um, the DR. Yeah. So um, with a tight timeline, I, I think it would be good if we're comfortable moving forward with at least the field, field data collection. Um, but I, I don't know what, if Keith has any thoughts. Yeah, I just would agree that we need to move forward. Um, if we don't get this completed before June 30th, um, we lose it all. So, um, and we have nothing. So, if we don't get moving for moving forward. We really don't have many other choices. Okay. 
And 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 remind me how much the grant was for in total. Fifty-seven something. Fifty-seven something. So we're forty shy ish. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would make a motion that we uh, enter an agreement with uh, Ty and Bond to perform the engineering and design services. I would second that. All those in favor, Joyce. Aye. Fred. Fred. Aye. Me, yes. Unanimous. I like to make a comment um, on, on the design considerations here, if I could. Sure, Fred. Go ahead. I, I think uh, I know the design is is for replacing the, the culvert there, but I think in this is more information for Keith, I guess, during design, whether we need to look at, at future projects in that area. And one is, you know, the, the intersection is close there and there's turn lanes uh, are, an, are an issue, trucks turning. And if you need, you know, five more feet of pavement on the south side, does that mean this box, this culvert needs to be that much longer? Th that should be considered and uh, not to not to design the turn lane, but a five foot longer culvert if it would help in the future on that side. And on the north side, I think the complete streets program had a sidewalk going along the north side, which I think is is the same side it is on the 91 uh, on Christian Lane Bridge over I 91. If that sidewalk is to continue all the way to to Castaways. Uh, there may be a need for a bigger, a longer culvert on the north side to make room for a sidewalk. And you know, today we don't need, a, may not need a sidewalk there, uh, but in the future there may be. And also at that location, at that intersection, which would help for justifying a sidewalk, there is either a temporary or future uh, uh, FRTA uh, bus stop there. I think they may stop now as uh, as uh, on call, but I think that is a future location for a bus stop. So you know, if you have a bus stop there, it's possible people could get off there and walk to Yankee Candle in the future. We don't know. So just to to uh, consider that in a design for future use uh, of Christian Lane in that area. Okay, definitely. Um, I can just elaborate that. Brian, myself, um, yeah, Hannah was there too. We met with on a Zoom meeting with MassDOT and Franklin Regional Council of Government. And that was a topic of discussion. So um, we're, we're on top of that, Fred, as best as, best as we can. Okay. okay, appreciate your input, but just Look into the future. What maybe needs in that in that area, and I think you're you're on top of it. Just a reminder that it may come about in the future. Okay. I think that's what we do consistently with all decisions in town. So I I, I think we're we're good there. But I appreciate the the reminder, Fred, very much. Um, yeah. Opioid class action lawsuit, Brian. Yeah, but we're plaintiffs, so that's good. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, so there was class actions lawsuit, uh, class action lawsuits against uh, three opioid manufacturers um, who entered into a settlement agreement um, with essentially the class. Um, and when this lawsuit started, um, the courts pretty much enjoined everybody, um, every municipality, state, and local unit of government. Uh, was all made part of the class. Um, so um, essentially the bottom line is, is that, is that the, the settlement that was reached is $537 million um, in funds for Massachusetts. And this was through the state. Um, so it's $537 million in funds to the Commonwealth and its cities and towns over 18 years um, to prevent harm reduction treatment and recovery efforts across Massachusetts. I'm not sure what form that will reach us in. Um, I mean, if, if we cut right down to it, um, unless the town of Waitley is planning to sue these uh, opioid manufacturers independently, um, we probably um, take what is 
offered to us um, in whatever form that may come. And the email that's on the screen right now is a is an email from the uh, Attorney General's office encouraging municipalities to accept the accept the settlement. But I don't I don't have any figures as to Waitley's going to get yeah. X amount of dollars or access to these programs. Um, right, but in the absence of us hiring a bunch of attorneys and having a different suit, we get something rather than nothing. Right. Well, I think I'm on the side of something. <laughs> I, I I think we should take something. Yeah, I, I, I don't think we can afford to mount our own um, our own legal battle as a municipality. So um, I would be willing to move that we enter into the settlement agreement for the opioid class action lawsuit. Sorry, I missed it. I apologize. Are we looking for something, Brian? I apologize. We I made a motion. I made a motion okay. to enter into the settlement agreement for the opioid class action lawsuit. Uh, all those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Brad? Aye. Me, yes. Um, Jenny Morrison to the Cultural Council. I'm in favor of that. So am I. I'm just getting off Cultural Council when, and she was she was great on there. Do we have a motion? I move Jenny Morrison for the Cultural Council. Uh, I'll second that. All those in favor, Fred? Aye. Me, uh, Joyce? Aye. Me, yes. Winter parking regulations for towns and roads and town-owned properties. This is- Oh, it's about time. Every year, and we are a month. <laughs> Late. It didn't snow yet. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll make a motion right away because I don't see the reason to, to discuss it really. Uh, motion to adopt winter parking regulations. Second. Second. All those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Fred? Aye. Me, yes. Updates, Brian? Um, library accessibility improvement project that went out to bid. Um, and I forget the name of the of the little better diversified general construction LLC. I think something along those lines. It's I wrote it in the email. I'll find it. Um, town received a, a recycling dividends program grant that was awarded, and that we have I think we have a healthy balance in our grant account, and that's for to encourage recycling within the town. Um, so it's about fifty six hundred dollars. Um, into the the RDP grant account. Uh, the town also received. This is going to be sideways. Um, <laughs> and good job by Amy, um, Amy Lavalley. She submitted the the Maya grant, um, and all of these were awarded to us on uh, the amount of uh, four thousand five hundred eighty three dollars of safety equipment. So, uh, gas meters, safety equipment uh, for the transfer station, uh, chainsaw kits and then confined space um, entry. So that's a, a gas monitor calibration kit. All items that will help keep town employees safe and our insurance rates low, we hope, in terms of our workers' comp insurance. Um, so the we had the first meeting of the, the Coronavirus Local Fiscal Recovery Fund Committee. Um, and we have put out a, a solicitation, essentially a solicitation for projects or it was a project screening form um, to help start our discussion as to what uh, the more immediate needs are that folks might have or ideas that they have for these monies. Um, so we're, we're meeting again on December 8th. We're hoping to get those forms back by, um, I think we said the 7th, possibly the 6th or 7th, um, I think it was the 7th. Um, and just to allay anyone's fears, that's not like a, if you don't apply by this deadline, then no, no coronavirus money for you. Um, we just need to start the process of getting ideas in and, and start having discussions about those. There might've been a little misunderstanding that caused some angst to a few people, um, but we're not looking for fully developed projects at this point. 
Um, the other thing I um, want the input from the board on is um, purchasing um, new shades for the town offices. Um, and now this is gonna go the, the wrong way. Um, all the shades that we currently have in these offices are broken. Oh. Um, they're original to the building. Um, I got to show uh, Fred Fred B firsthand when he came into my office when he had to stare at the sun when he was uh, talking to me. Um, you, you don't like getting sun in your office? No. Um, <laughs> I like to shut out the shut out the world when I when I'm trying to get my work done. Um, so these are quotes to just get uh, those vertical blinds replaced with um, roller shades. May I add something, Brian? Sure. Um, it just came to my attention because uh, Lynn was talking about how when she's here at night, she can't see who's coming into the parking lot. She can't tell who it is or anything like that. So it's kind of a safety issue too because she can't open her shades in her office. So that was the biggest reason why I approached this. And would that behind you be an example of the lovely shades? That oh, yes. Not really See, working? they are open with my levers because they're stuck like that. <laughs> this, this, is, this is not even something that should be discussed. If, if things are broken, we should fix them. Done. If this is a good quote, I trust you guys to find the best quote you can find. That you're 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 not you're not shopping at, at for for shades at 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 uh, Nemo Walmart. Market. <laughs> I don't even know that they sell shades, but uh, let's just let's just get them. I, I when you the ones you're replacing them with are not just uh, working versions of the ones you have. They're I, I heard you say roller shades, so it's going to be like the that kind that you know, industrial strength so that they'll actually last for a while. Yes, and they'll be um, mesh. I have a sample right here. So oh. you'll be able to see, this is what most um, municipalities are doing now. So you can actually see through them, but they still filter the light if you want that. Oh, okay. You're, you're the ones who have to live with them if that's what you want, right? Ryan, you're going to make an executive decision and buy them as the administrator, I assume, or no? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make sure this was all right because it's a yeah. bigger price tag. Yeah, well, it is what it is. Okay. Anything else? Um, just the last thing about the South County Senior Center Director hiring update. Uh, just, there was a, a search committee, a screening committee of applicants, and they have... Uh, the search committee has recommended three applicants um, to the South County Senior Center Board of Oversight and Deerfield Select Board. Um, hopefully those interviews will get scheduled sometime, I believe sometime in, in December. Um, and hopefully they'll have um, an excellent candidate on board to help lead the, the Senior Center through the next, you know, it's next, how many every years? 30 years. A lot of, a lot of work <laughs> going on there, so. Okay. All right. Anything else? Just out of curiosity, what was the situation with the poll hearing that I wasn't able to get here earlier? That's funny because I was going to mention something about that too. It's really been delayed to the next, not the next meeting, but the one after that, which will be either the 15th or the 22nd. But I, there are rumors that they actually started the work on one of those already. And I, it was a rumor, so I didn't bring it up during the regular uh during the regular time but i was wondering if since keith was not here but keith is here so he might know if something had happened over there i i'm the poll hearing as far as the stuff on long plain road no this was on um, river uh the thing that's supposed to go under river road and connect uh to a pole that's on the other side of river road from uh one that's on christian lane the, an underground thing that they started digging into our asphalt basically is kind of what the rumor was but i haven't had a chance to drive by there and but i thought you might have yeah it 
I can tell you that 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 it has been done. Um, you know, at the moment when they uh, came to me, I wasn't aware that that was going to require a poll hearing huh. um, to do the the work in the in the pavement and knowing the timeline that needed to be done to get this moving forward for Yankee Candle and they I okay. needed to have it done before the asphalt plant shut down on Thanksgiving so um, but I wasn't aware that they needed a poll hearing on that yeah. part of it. I, this is rumor so it might be that for what they did they didn't need a poll hearing so that's for all I know but that was just a that was okay. you know uh, unverified information that I heard is all. Keith, Keith, if you could, if you could look into whether they should have had a poll hearing or not, that would be great. Okay, I'll I'll Thank look you. into that more yeah. and discuss that with Brian. the The other thing that I was just going to say, uh, you know, the here the poll locations on on Long Plain Road, basically, um, I can tell what they're trying to do, and that is just trying to balance the spans. Um, so there'll be like a new pole about twenty feet from an existing pole and the existing pole will be removed so it's it's you know it's really i guess probably does need a pole hearing because it's not like within a few inches of the existing ones but it's not really changing the scope of things and the same thing with the one on on christian lane by yankee candle um it's just an a that one's an additional pole because they've got one section of this the span is is tremendously long, and when they put the new heavier wires on, they need a shorter span. Right. What Keith? What we decided was we we just didn't discuss any of it because all this is going to have to be regurgitated again on the fifteenth. So okay, why beat the horse twice? Okay. So. Well, right. In um, spite of how much we love poll hearings. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah. Um, and hey, Brian, last word on poll hearings. Please make sure all utilities show up well I, I think they weren't here because they didn't have the the appropriate link even the ones that told um bill swayze what the appropriate link was i i imagine bill may have went the extra mile to see it check the meeting Perhaps. agenda that would that would that would make sense for for bill that uh, that makes sense i just please make sure it, it, oh just, trust me the expectation is that they show up even even, um, you know, even even if the ones aren't supposed to be there, have them all show up anyway, and we can have a big party. <laughs> May I just say that I did receive an email from the representative from Eversource who was trying to get into the Zoom link, but by the time I got the email, we had oh. already gone past that. So I just let them know that it was rescheduled. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Amy. All right, You're do welcome. I hear a motion to adjourn? So yes, second. All those in favor, Joyce. Aye. Fred. Aye. Me, yes. Good night and good luck, everybody. Good night. Night, good night, Aye, everybody. Thank you. Good night.